my name is James Barrett. I'm on the uh, Writers, Producers, Directors uh, Committee of, of BEC2, and uh, I'm also a filmmaker. And I'm um, really happy I've assembled such a great lineup of, of people to talk about uh, new opportunities for distribution. I think that particularly focusing on kind of online uh, content and uh, video on demand and so on. We have um, Vivian Avery from the BFI. She's the, the head of research and statistics at the BFI. Um, she comes from a background of working in government departments, including the Department of Culture for Media and Sport and the Office for National Statistics. So she'll be able to reflect on the market at present and kind of speculate as to how it's going to develop. Uh, then we have Marcus Marcu, who is uh, the producer and director of Papadopoulos and Sons, uh, which has been a, a film that's been very successful in, it, in terms of its sales and distribution, and he'll give us some background to that. And then we have Julia Short, who, who was at Verve and is now uh, the managing director of... Is it House? House. House. I've asked her three the times. <laughs> and she'll be able to, to feed in on that. And then lastly, from... Distrify, uh, which I'm sure many people will know, we have uh, Alessandro Giacopone, who's um, kindly stepped in for Andy Green, who, who was originally advertised. Do come in. So, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to um, Vivienne, and thank you very much. All right. Thank you, James. Um, as, as James said, I'm, I'm the Head of Research and Statistics at the BFI. Um, what I'm going to just talk you through in the next 10 minutes, um, how many people here know about the BFI Research and Statistics Unit and the sort of stuff we publish? There's generally a sort of, quite a few of you do, okay. Well I'll say a bit for those who don't but I won't give too much detail. Um, and then I'm going to take you through some sort of, as James said, background contextual information about where the market is at the moment and what's been happening in terms of the growth of video on demand. Um, both in the UK and globally, and some of the implications for this in terms of changing behaviour um, and the challenges that we've still got, and then our sort of potential scenario of where we think we might be in 2023. So in terms of what we do at, at the BFI in our research and statistics area, we produce official statistics and research on the film industry, and really this was set up um, about 15 years ago in response to the fact there really weren't any and it was really hindering um, the ability of the industry to move on because it was very difficult to get consistent and reliable information um, without going to millions of different places. Um, we based this around a UK film database which covers the whole film value chain so um, those of you, as most of you are involved in production, we, we start at that stage, we for each film we find out about, we, we track what, what is in production, its budget, we then go on to look at its release, its performance theatrically, video, DVD, um, if, if people win awards, all of that sort of thing is put together so we can produce a good analysis across the industry. We publish our statistics quarterly and annually on the website, um, but we also do other um, research projects, mainly about the economic and cultural impact of film. Um, and, and some of those, I've just put some pictures up. Something else I wanted to mention today, because it's quite relevant, is the BFI Lottery Distribution Fund has been funding um, some films to look at new models of distribution, and they've written, as, as case studies, they've written up reports on these, what they've learned, called insight reports, and I think they, you might find these relevant. Um, you can find them on our website, but I've got a few findings from those we've got so far. Have, have any of you here worked on any of those films? I was conscious there might be people here who know more about them than me, um, but okay. Right, well looking, looking at the market, um, these charts here go up to 2012. We're working on the 2013 data at the moment, but I'll say a little bit when we come to it. This one looks at UK gross film revenue across all platforms from 1998 to 2012. And you can see that by 2012, well, by 2011, the, the market reached about 4 billion. Um, the, the big sources of revenue, the green TV, and that continues to grow. Um, and just at the top, the little ready purple colour, you can see the growth of video on demand starting to make a more significant contribution to the market as um, retail and rental video decline. Um, that was 2012, looking as we were yesterday, hastily scrabbling together 2013 data for you. Um, the market's gone up a bit again in terms of revenue, um, and the big growth area has been both 
uh, video on demand and TV. Um, looking at cinema admissions since 2001, they've been sort of reasonably steady. Um, they've fluctuated a bit. Um, this graph again up to 2012, they have gone down in 2013. Um, they've backed down to, I think, somewhere between the 2010-2011 level. If you look at uh, video on demand, audience spend, which is um, some of the data we're able to get hold of, this shows the trend since 2002 um, in two forms. The bottom one, the yellowy orange one, is um, the television based, which has grown a fair amount in that time, but the red one is the online video on demand, and you can see what a huge growth um, that that's had over the last few years, coming um, into the, if you go back a slide, the slides, the purple line at the top making its contribution felt. If you look at the home video market globally, um, Price Waterhouse do some forecasts up to 2017. Um, the green line is the sort of total revenue in US million dollars. You can see that by 2017 they reckon it'd be worth 25 billion dollars. Um, the red is TV subscriptions and the blue is the over the top um, video on demand streaming and you can see that 2014 where we are now is the point at which they estimate it's overtaking TV subscriptions. The figures on the right hand side are um, annual growth rates I think. So uh, what was the green line on that The last green line, sorry, the green line is the total so it's the blue plus the red okay. um, which gives quite a nice, it's a bit like the previous one where we see in the UK, sorry. You can see that exponential sort of growth curve coming through. Um, it's also quite interesting to look at understand film audience and audiences and how they access film by age group. Now this slide um, is taken from 2011, so it's a little bit out of date now, but you can see there are clear patterns, or there were in 2011, only three years ago, quite clear patterns in the different ways people access films with... Oh, please, would you stay there? <laughs> I don't know what's happened there. Okay, oh, it's gone again. Okay, so at the younger end, let's see if it's going to stay. Okay, at the younger end, um, pretty evenly split really across all platforms, but older people um, with the concentration much more TV based, the grey and the, the dark black lines. Um, the, if you can't see at the back, the, the um, the, the pale blue and the orange are the streaming lines, which back in 2011 were quite concentrated on the younger users. I think if you were updating this three years to 2014, you'd see that spread much more across the ages, and we'd expect to see the green on DVD going down. Um, I, just, I was just emailed some figures before I came about some data published today, I think by Barb, or, or recently published by Barb, where they're showing quite a big decline in 16 to 24 year olds watching live TV, and I know that's something the TV channels are concerned about. Okay, well, that's a bit about the shifting in platforms. We're also learning a bit about how behaviour's shifting. So Ofcom use these lovely phrases, media meshing and media stacking. Do they mean I don't think I've heard of those. I had to look it up myself, I admit. Um, media meshing is where people are using more than one screen um, on roughly the same task in the same room. So say you're watching TV on one screen and either, say, looking up an actor on IMDb or tweeting about your film at the same time. Um, media stacking is where you're using two different screens to do two unrelated tasks. So you're sort of watching your film on one screen at the same time, but you're on Facebook doing something or the other. So we need to understand how people are using all these new types of technology um, and understand their behaviour. Um, we, do, we do know from YouGov research that people are watching films on tablets and mobiles. I think there was a view a few years ago that they wouldn't be suitable, but it's quite clear people are doing that. And um, also emphasising the importance of social media um, and word of mouth um, in, in, in new models of distribution. Smart TVs are now a third of the new TVs sold um, and people are using them and their internet connectivity for VOD film and catch up TV. Um, but the evidence suggests that cinema will retain its audience for the quality of the viewing experience. Um, I'm going to come back to that one. 
Um, so what are the challenges with this new multi-platform world? Well, those that we're aware of is that the video on demand film inventories are currently quite small. They might not seem small if you look at them, but you can, if you do a search, and I think we did a project last year looking for the number of leading titles on a number of them, quite a lot of them were missing. I'm, I think we looked for Skyfall and couldn't find it on quite a lot of platforms and films like that, you, you know, you would ex expect to see. That's because Sky wouldn't pay them enough money. Possibly. That's why it was. Oh, it was, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Short form content is, is still um, preferred on mobile devices, so people don't, the evidence suggests people aren't watching full length feature films on their mobiles, but again that could change in the next few years. Um, pricing still considered quite high, both cinema prices and video on demand. Um, and smart TV um, is expected to sort of take over physical video um, by providing the the VOD inventories extend. There's a lot of discussion about when that might actually happen and when VOD might overtake DVD and, and, and physical video. And depending on who you are, your estimate is anything from 2017 till 2020. So although video on demand has this huge growth rate at the moment, it's important to remember DVD is still quite a significant market and it could be another six years before one overtakes the other. Um, there's no tracking service in this country for film on video on demand, so we've got no data on what the most popular films are. Um, everyone's refusing to release their data, even, even the BFI player um, at my own company um, is refusing, although they, they, they will tell you that the most popular films are those about sex and trams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, okay. for, and, and no one has yet made a film about sex on trans, apparently. <laughs> right, um, the, the distribution fund has been trying to um, help develop new mis business models for distribution and, and by funding a number of projects and reporting on these with these insight reports. Um, and there's probably a bit too much to read on the screen here for now, but I just wanted to flag these up because there's some quite interesting findings coming up and you can get them all off the website and, and there might be things you want to look at. So um, for borrowed time, um, the, the main lesson from that when it looked at um, different distribution models was that getting your distribution strategy considered very early on in the, in the film's lifespan. Um, what Maisie knew, we learned a bit about price points and how that affected your total revenue. Um, and a field in England was quite an interesting one because it looked at um, launching, releasing the film on all platforms at the same time. And 70 cent, said that we found that 77% of the audience knew they could watch it for free at home on, at, on TV on the day one, but they still chose to go to the cinema. So there's some quite interesting um, finding, and there's about, I think there's about 12 of them, so, and they're quite short reports, so you, you might want to have a look at those. In terms of the future then, have I got a minute or two? Okay. Um, our, our vision really for, for 2023 about where it might go is, is we still see that cinema will be flourishing um, and wide release films will continue to have some sort of release video window before it goes to video on demand. Um, people like the, the quality of the cinema experience and they like the social nature of it or they like to go and see a film with friends. Um, we think narrow release films will probably have a similar release date with video on demand. Uh, we think that there'll still be a role for linear TV. By that I mean a sort of programme of TV programmes. There's a lot of research around from different fields that suggest people don't like, actually like too much choice. They can cope with choice to a certain extent, but actually it gets a bit overwhelming. And people like the idea of still having channels with a list of programmes for the evening. Um, we think nearly all, all TVs will be internet connected by then in, in a range of ways, not just for video on demand, but browsers and all sorts of other things. Um, we think by then uh, video on demand will have replaced physical video in, in terms of a significant market and people might not necessarily get rid of their existing collections, but we don't think people will be buying it anymore. Um, and we think that feature films will try and build more of a mobile market with short form spin-offs. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll take questions after all of the panellists, as I'm sure people are starting to form. So I'd like to invite uh, Marcus to talk about his experiences. Thank you. Should I get the trailer on? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I won't bore you with my 
background biography or even what the film's about. But we're going to play the trailer of the film and that will give you, hopefully, a little bit of information about what, what is the film. And then we'll talk about building an audience, how one builds an audience. It's about Greeks who lose everything in a banking crisis and have to start again at a chip shop. It was very timely. Uh, the story came out just as the Greek crisis was taking off and was released in the UK uh, theatrically a week after the Cypriot banking crisis hit the news. So it was very timely. My bit here really is to explain to you that however you're releasing your film, whether it's VOD uh, or whatever platform you go by, you still have to build an audience. Now, I, I will jump straight to the story of what I had to do. I, um, I found myself in, at the beginning of 2013 uh, doing my own theatrical release in the UK. It's very rare for the filmmaker to do that. I convinced Cineworld that I could put my film in 13 of their Cineworld sites and I could get an audience to come to it. And a uh, very naive thing to try and <laughs> take on. And, but really, uh, again, it, it's, it's kind of, it, it's, I had to improvise my way through this story of how I was going to build an audience. And it has an impact on VOD because whether you are going VOD or whether you're going to theatre, you need to find an audience. And what I discovered on this sort of journey was that you can find your niche audience and you can reach them cheaply and you can get them to become aware of your film uh, outside of the traditional marketing activity of a just distribution company, which might spend many millions of pounds to, to put posters on buses, to put posters at bus stations and throw mud at the wall. I went the other way. I, I identified a core audience that would be interested in seeing this film. Yes, it's a universal story. Yes, it appeals to people who aren't Greek. And it did very well at film festivals in America. And it did well in film festivals in France. And it had a very successful traditional release in Germany, interestingly. I, I managed to sell the film traditionally to a German distributor and we sold it to a Greek distributor. I couldn't get a British distributor for the UK. Okay, so I effectively became my own distributor. How did I do it? I built up a network of ambassadors, around 30 people, again, mainly Greeks. Some of them were friends, some people came through Twitter. I put the call out, I said, here I am, I'm the writer, I'm the director. I'm also the producer, and now I'm the distributor, and that connected with people. It's a real story. It's not, 
your conventional marketing PR from a, dist from a distribution company or a studio. And I thought in my head, I've got to build up a list of these supporters. And these are people that hadn't seen the film. And I made them feel part of the journey. And I put the example there, Auntie P. Auntie P isn't my auntie. She was a Greek, an eccentric Greek lady in Manchester who followed me on Twitter and would literally give up her work, to take holidays, to go and put flyers at the Hellenic uh, uh, sort of society at Manchester University. Uh, yeah, this is true. And this is what you would need to be thinking of when you are getting your film out there. Um, and I, because I had, uh, I'd managed to convince Cineworld to give us 13 screens. I wasn't given the actual date until two or three weeks beforehand, because that's how it works. You get your date quite late because you're really filling up spaces. So I had to build up a list, an email list of all my supporters. And these people were charged with finding other supporters that I could add to my email list. And I used MailChimp, which is a piece of software you can embed on your website. And it's an email capture page. And I was capturing emails through my Facebook, through my Twitter. And if you go to the Papadopoulos and Sons Facebook, you'll see ex I made it more interesting. Um, I treated Facebook as an online magazine. So I went beyond just conventional posts about the film. You know, we ha I started a debate because some people said, you know, because I was using Stephen Delane as an actor. Stephen Delane, who's in Game of Thrones, plays Stannis. He's not really Greek. Uh, I had a lot of flack from some of the Greeks saying, how can you cast a non-Greek? So I stuck a picture of my son up there who's blonde and blue-eyed. Uh, he is my son. Uh, and I, I can verify that. And I said, oh, I hope he is. Uh, and uh, I said, uh, what does a Greek look like? You know? And it brought a huge debate. And a debate about ethnicity uh, started to kick in on the Facebook. Went beyond just promoting the film. And it was me doing it. And I was interacting. You know, I started a Q&A session randomly. I'd go, right, I'm here. I'm on my Facebook page. Who wants to ask me any question, any question about the film, I'll answer it honestly. Bang, how much was your budget? Uh, how did you get Stephen Delane? And I, I treated it like a magazine. And I think when you guys are building your audience, you've got to think that way with Facebook. You need to engage. You need to make yourself open. I was the filmmaker. It's really exciting. People were, were, felt they had access to me. And this was before they'd even seen the film. Um, I will skip through, and this is probably something that Julia will talk about, but there are ways of finding your niche audience. So like what I discovered with, uh, with Facebook was you could do geo-targeting. So you can search on Facebook for everyone who has Greek, Greece, Cyprus, Greek music in their profile. And you can build up a demographic, and you can get your ad shown. So instead of sticking a poster on a bus, you can actually stick a poster in front and a trailer in front of your demographic. Who is the demographic for your film? Who are the people that are going to come and be interested in your film? You can find them on Facebook. The other thing I did was I thought, I'm going I'm to stick this in front of every industry person. And you can target people who work at the BBC. And I did that. And one of my blog posts, when, when I was releasing the film in Greece, was about the poverty I'd seen in Greece. And uh, I'd seen mothers begging with their kids. And I, I wrote about that on my blog. I kept an honest blog. I put that on Facebook. I promoted it to the industry. And someone at the BBC picked that story up and ran with it. You know, um, so again, it's a, again about developing a dialogue with what it is that you're doing, why you're out there, beyond the film, I think. Um, how are we doing for time? Left. Oh, my. Some other quick ideas. I'm rushing through this. Um, but I did, instead of doing a premiere, again, if, if, listen, if you're going to do your VOD, if your strategy as filmmakers is going to go straight to VOD, you can still do offline stuff. Uh, I did community screenings of the making of Papadopoulos and Sons. So I thought, before I did my theatrical release, we were told by Cineworld, you've got one week. You've got 13 screens. 
you need to do 500 per screen. I thought, this is what Martin told me, I thought 500 meant 500 people. Actually, it was 500 pounds to get a second week. And you'll see my figures, they're good. I, I did community screenings. Instead of doing a premiere, everyone wants a premiere, you want the red carpet, I got rid of that. I did community screenings with the Greek community and I showed them the making of, I did a Q&A with 300 people at each. I each gave them 50 flyers and they went out and promoted it. I had my day, April the 5th, bring the community to Cine Worlds across. And we had four Cine Worlds in London, we had Cine Worlds in Birmingham, Manchester. I basically looked at a map of Britain, wherever there was a Greek church, I put a pin in it and went, that is where I'm gonna put a Cine World. And uh, I won't, there are so many marketing activities that I did, and I'm only gonna pick a couple of these. Greek Orthodox priest, second one at the bottom, it's interesting. I cold, cold called every Greek Orthodox priest, all 72 of them, yes. I got a Greek to do it, actually, a fellow a friend of mine, because my Greek's not good, <laughs> much to my parents' shame. And uh, we told them, can you announce the film in the, in the Sunday liturgy before Thursday, the 5th of April? <laughs> this is what we're doing. And they, they did. The call went out. And I got talking to a big Spanish distributor recently. I think it's one of Spain's biggest distributors. He said, I heard about this. The whole, your whole Greek Orthodox distribution <laughs> plan. And he said, that is what we need to be doing as distributors. What you did, calling the priests, announcing it in the, in the, in the church. <laughs> and I won't bore you because I've, we've only got a few minutes, but there were so many different angles that I was exploiting to get everybody on the 5th of April to sit my city worlds. And my first week admissions were crazy. From just 13, 13 sites, we did 8,000 admissions. We had the second highest screen average of any film. I was only in 13 screens, but we had the second highest screen average of any film that weekend. Only Oblivion with Tom Cruise had a higher screen average. The Greeks turned out in force. There was buzz. There was Shaftesbury Avenue hadn't seen anything like it. No. And, and these Greeks, I mean, I'm telling you, they, they don't just buy cinema tickets, they buy food. A lot of it. And I'm telling you, Cineworld owe me, because I didn't get a cut of any of the nachos. Um, and, uh, and, and it was remarkable. In Cineworld, Shaftesbury Avenue, we were the number one film there. We started in the 200-seat 100 100 screen, went to the 200-seat screen, we ended up in the 500-seat screen. We were there for four weeks. We were the number one film for three of those weeks in Cineworld, centre of London, okay, with a niche title, capturing a niche audience. And of course it has a huge effect on, um, on uh, the film's future because we sold it to the BBC, Arte and France. Arte, a French-German broadcasters, bought it. Netflix took it. I created a buzz. Encore in flight is a big uh, airline distributor took it. Um, uh, we did various deals. The point is, I made it an event. And it doesn't matter if you're Universal Pictures and you're making a, uh, a Brad Pitt movie, it's an event. I decided to make my film an event, equivalent event, to a niche market. And, um, the budget of the film was a million quid. So a year in, we're about 40% recouped, which is good. Um, we, you know, there were, I don't think I will talk about this because this goes into another kind of part of the story, how I did the BBC deal. There was a traditional German distribution. Breaking up ancillary rights is important. Yeah, I mean, we, we decided to break up the rights for VOD uh, and uh, we used different companies to do different types of deals for the film. The point is, I created enough buzz through, through the emerging story of this film and there is a huge story to this film, even before I did my Cineworld kind of adventure, um, that got... You know, if you end up working with someone like Julia or Distrify, you know, it, this can only help do the sales. It can only help do the sales. How long have I got? 
We're wrapped up. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, Julia, can I invite you to... Can I just say, I'm in absolute admiration of this guy, because he that is a lot of time and a huge, huge success. So, seriously. I feel a little bit lame after that. I have the energy. It's like, Jesus Christ, what have I been doing all my life? Um, I'm Julia Shaw. I've been working um, in film distribution for 25 years, I think, actually, sadly, this year. Um, so I come from um, what I call I get I call old school. So I started at Rag Film Distributors um, and worked for a number of very traditional distribution companies. Um, in 2003, I set up my own distribution company, Verve Pictures, which was something that. I'd always wanted to do, because I'd always wanted to release, acquire and release the films that I was always incredibly passionate about. Um, the lesson that I learned very quickly was that the films that I like personally, which is Bleak Misery, actually isn't a great business model, um, because apparently people don't like watching Bleak Misery in the cinema, apart from me. Um, so after 10 years of doing that, um, I felt that there was a new world out there and that actually, you know, DVD was declining and that there was video in demand. And my business partner at the time was, he came from an exhibition background, so I guess he he's always saw the, the cinema as being the pinnacle of what a film should achieve. Whereas um, I felt that most films that are made, 99% of films that are made, I think do have an audience. And we all have to decide where that audience is. And that's not necessarily an audience that will go to the cinema, the, the audience might be online. So I set up a distribution company as of the 1st of January to th this year, um, and we have acquired 29 films um, for VOD exploitation. And the business model is that we have, we bought a number of films that are going straight to VOD, We've bought a number of films where we've done, which Vivian, is Vivian, yeah. Yeah. Vivian mentioned, where we'd, we've done theatrical day on day with VOD. Um, we might go, going forward, we might look at doing more traditional um, releases. I think the one thing that we haven't covered is in Vivian's, for, you know, doing her projections to 2020, 2023 and saying about going day and date, no main cinema chain, as in Odeon, View, or Cineworld, will play your film if you do not stick to the traditional window. And the traditional window is 16 weeks and four days. So if you want your film to go into an Odeon cinema or a View or a Cineworld, you, you cannot go on VOD for 16 weeks. So you're very limited to what options are available to you. So we as an industry, well, as in ex exhibition, have got to come in line with how the world is actually working. Because actually, when you're, like what Marcus has been doing, is when you're spending all that time, you're building up a huge head of steam and a huge amount of awareness, is I personally think we should allow the consumer to watch the film how, they want, how and where they want to watch it. The studios dictate, they're very successful at dictating, I'm going to put my film in the cinema at this date at a certain price, and four months later you'll be able to buy it on DVD, and two years later it will go on to television. Now that works brilliantly for the studios, it doesn't work in the independent sector, because if you're putting all that time and effort into building awareness, you, you've got to get it out, haven't you? You can't just sit there and go, okay, I've put because you can't reheat a film, it kind of it goes cold. So I think that the challenge for us, you know, for the industry, is we've got to get exhibition to understand that they've got to be a bit more flexible with those windows so that we can allow those um, windows to come closer. Um, I guess the key thing with uh, the things that I've learned in the short time that I've had my VOD distribution company is, it's like Marcus was saying, is 
We have acquired films on the basis that there is, we've identified the audience for the film. We've very clearly identified that there is an audience and that we know how to get to them. And it's time consuming, but it's not hugely expensive. So actually on a number of films, it's like with Marcus's, is there's 99% of the population that you can ignore. You just go, I'm not interested. They're never going to come and see it. I'm going to put all my time, money and effort into the 1% niche audience that I want, that I, I've identified for my film. So we've acquired films on the basis that we've bought documentaries where there's obviously an input audience based on what the subject matter is. We're releasing, this weekend, we're releasing Ty West's uh, The Sacrament, Eli Roth presents, you know, it's, it is what it is. It's a horror film, what a surprise, you know. Um, so obviously got an inbuilt audience, that's obviously an inbuilt audience. So how we, our, our business model is that uh, we're using a third-party aggregator to, to deliver all the products to the platforms. What we do in-house is we do all the leafleting and social media and Facebook and flyering and PR and getting interviews and is that that's what that's the service that we provide so we acquire the film use a third party aggregator I mean the idea we're hoping that we'll have enough product that iTunes will actually talk to us directly but you have to have enough product that they talk to you directly because otherwise they don't want to talk to every single person in this room because we all got one film they want to talk to um so uh, um, just a few of uh, my few observations that I think the one thing that is so different about the VOD world, and I know Vivian's um, covered this already, is the lack of transparency on numbers. You know, if I have to say, you know, the BFI, I am the biggest fan of research and statistics unit at the BFI. Um, the, the data that is on that site is just so amazing. So you can get box office figures, we know what films are opening, we know everything. In the online world, it's all, it's all smokes and mirrors, it's all a myth. You know, why do we think House of, House of Cards is successful? Because Netflix have told us it's successful. They haven't told us how many people have watched it. They just send out a press release going, oh, House of Cards, it's fantastically successful. Orange is the only new black, hugely successful. Well, I could sit here and kind of, my company's fantastically successful because of all my films. I mean, it's just nonsense. So it's that lack of data of knowing, you know, we look at, actually, can I just go online now? I think, I like, I think so while, while this is loading, is I think that there's two... There's another fundamental difference with cinemas and going to the cinema. The cinema sets the ticket price. As a distributor, you cannot dictate the ticket price. So if a film costs $100 million to make, or it's a micro-budget film and it costs £100,000 to make, the ticket price is going to be the same. Now, in no other business is the pricing the same. If I go... I always use a clothing analogy, but as there's a lot of men here, I'll use a car analogy. <laughs> is, you know, if I go and buy a Mercedes Benz, I pay a bit more for it because I expect it to be quite a nice car with a nice engine and it'll beep when I go backwards and I hit something. I'll, if I will expect to pay, spend a little bit less on this Skoda because I kind of know what I'm getting. So though that pricing doesn't work in any other industry apart from the, you know, unique in the film industry. And what's great about online is, is that you can actually affect the price. You can dictate the price of something. So if you want, and this is what I was trying to give you. iTunes store's not connected. iTunes store's not connected. But, I mean, if you go onto the iTunes store, there's, there's a particular film that I wanted to show you. That there's a film in, if you look at the kids and family films, it's all studio product. Loads and loads and loads of studio product. Very little independent uh, product. But there's a film that's at number six, six called What If? And it's been there for weeks and it's just been in the top ten for weeks. And I was going, what's that all about? Never heard of it. And actually if you look at it, they're really smart because they've 
make you can buy it for three ninety nine, or you can view it for a pound, ninety nine p. And that is holding its own amongst all the studio product because they're sensibly pricing it. You want the US? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Um, much better poster in the UK. Um, so I think one thing that's really interesting is we can dictate the price point, and it's instant. So, for example, we had we had a film that was what we felt was underperforming. We put it up. We released it just before Easter, and it was not hitting the figures that we wanted it to. So on the Thursday before Easter, we looked at the weather forecast and saw that the weather forecast wasn't fabulous, so we thought, oh, people might actually stay in and watch films. So we literally put all of the price points down for the four days of the Easter weekend to see if there was going to be, if we could get an uplift, which we did. And then you, but then you can put the pricing back up, and then at another point, you can... So it's very flexible pricing, which is kind of very unique. Um, <coughs> and the other thing to say, because I'm going to... I could talk about various things, um, is I spend my whole life on pla various platforms. I look at Amazon, I look at <coughs> iTunes, I go to Netflix, just seeing who's watching what and looking at the rankings, is I'm astounded by the number of the products that does incredibly well that I've never heard of, but done incredibly well. And then, in fact, when you add, there was one film called Late T T T T Tomaha, I think it's called, and it was in the charts for ages and ages. And I looked up all the actors, think, no, they're not in anything, director, no, hasn't done anything. It's like, why is this? And then found out that the three girls, it's basically a teen movie about kids going to summer camp. Right. That's what I could tell from the trailer, anyway, I'm sure something happened, but. Um, <laughs> but I looked up, and they've got the most, they've got their own multi channel network, and they've got loads of followers on YouTube, and they've just got their inbuilt audience. So there's an audience out there that normal film people, well, I would never call myself normal, but that film people like me, there's a whole universe where there's, when it's going back to audiences, these three girls knew that they had the most massive following, and they did incredibly well. Um, in terms of keep holding their numbers up and keeping it really, really high. So I, th I guess the, my, my primary thing is, and I think Marx's is, is, is knowing who your audience is. And don't... Actually, if you say your film's for everybody, you're fucked. Because <laughs> do you know what? You will never, ever, ever have enough money or enough time to market your film to everybody. If you can sell it to a studio and get them to pay for everything, fantastic, because they can market it to everybody. But actually, you're far better off having a really specific audience. You know exactly who they are. You know where they are. You know where they go to church. You know what radio station they listen to. And that's a far easier marketing challenge than it is, oh, my film's for everybody. So I just I haven't got enough time. I've got enough time to talk to every single priest in every single church in every single town. <laughs> so I'm going to, on that note, I'm going to pass over. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Okay. <laughs> I hope uh, everybody knows this street fire. I mean, uh, but I will go through what we actually do. But I would like to talk in general about VOD distribution and about uh, how things are evolving. Uh, before uh, joining Distrifa, I was working at, at Mobi. So the last five years I've been dealing with uh, VOD and uh, in general with content online and pre how to monetize premium content online. Um, it's not working, but anyway, um, perfect. So Distrify, it um, basically provides you with a tool, with a technology to engage with the audience. As we said before, it's very important to know where your audience is, but it's very important that they engage, because when people are engaged, they can actually pay online. Because in a, if you assume that people will pay just for any content or just... It's too much choice out there. On the online world is not a TV. It's a different. I mean, it's very important to know exactly what your audience is, but how to engage, how to make them really. I really want to watch this and to price that well. That's a very important point. 
So this refi provides you with the technology to do this, but it's up to you to make your film successful with this refi or, uh, or not. So it's up to you to build up the audience. First of all, I guess, even before you produce the film, that's very important because otherwise you can actually, you know, uh, uh, produce something where there is no audience. And then once you do that, you can actually engage directly with it. So I believe, I mean, uh, uh, the um, technology, it's something that can bring you somewhere, but what is important is what you actually bring, the content. So this refi, you, you have to see this refi as the technology that can help you to engage and make the people watch the film and pay for it. As we said before, it's very important transparency. Uh, with this refi, you have access to all the data, so you can geolocate the people that are watching your film, get the email, actually build up your mailing list, uh, work, uh, work yourself. I think it's very important. I mean, this was a great example with Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, work with multi-channel network. So uh, uh, obviously, n not only you know your audience, but you also talk to your audience and engage directly because that's what they want. They want to speak with the director, direct, uh, with the director, for example. They want to know about details. They want to be part of that film itself because that's uh, that's how they uh, that's why they pay for it. I mean, and so this refi, you have to see. I mean, uh, this is the site. You can go and check. I mean, I think uh, this. Uh, why I wanted to see the. Mm, the site here is because you can see very well how you can share content online with this picture. So I'll make an example. This refi is like a player where you can watch the trailer and then decide to buy them. So let's say if you build up before the audience with Facebook, Twitter and uh, YouTube, you can actually place the trailer everywhere with social media and even with publishers and people when they see the trailer they can uh, actually watch the trailer and then buy the film. Um, it's very important in my opinion, I'm very interested always why, uh, not only why people pay, but how do you get the audience online, because obviously as a cost too, I mean to build up uh, the audience before you can do that and I think you are the best person to do that, but it's very important to understand, for example, which publisher or um, which fan, let's put it this way, uh, can help you to spread the word, to share the film online, let's say through his blog, through his Facebook page, so that's, it's, it's up to you, it's up to your strategy to do that. And we provide you with the, the technology, which is actually um, the, the most important side is actually what you do with that, you know, and it's not the technology itself. There is always a gap between, you know, where technology brings you and what actually the reality is. You can build up the most um, impressive code and spend like half million in, uh, in uh, coding Ruby on Rails like Twitter, but then you don't do anything with that. So. It's how understanding very well social media and how to, to, to use it. So I think the most successful cases in, uh, with this refad, I won't go into the details of, uh, of the film. I would say in general, I believe like uh, in the, you know, the rule 80-20. So 80% of the time, the, the titles that uh, actually perform very well are the ones that um, not, uh, were obviously the rights holder, let's go it this way, that can be the director itself, the distributor, engages directly with the audience knows very well a niche um, and that that's most of the time works that's where it works very well when actually people just upload a lot of films they don't have a clear strategy they don't have a social media strategy that doesn't work so much I would say this refight could um, over uh, performs compared to iTunes in certain titles again where the the rights holder engaged or where the rights holder knows very well the audience and um, I think uh, also, I mean, apart from building the social media, it's very important to build up your relationship with the publishers online who's got credibility on an issue and uh, place that player that you can see at this refi in the right context. Because content is king, but context is king too. I mean, that's why, you know, there it's, uh, again, technology is very important, the user interface, but it's very important the user experience. It's very important the context where you actually place not only the player, but where you actually place the information itself. So, again, all these things you have to do that yourself, but it's, uh, we provide you with a technology that it's very expensive to, to build, as you can imagine, and to be effective. And um, so this is like uh, the Distrify um, experience and uh, the opportunity that you all have if you produce films. But obviously, again, the VOD, it's something different. You cannot think about the digital rights as any other right, as we mentioned before. So exclusive, there is no exclusivity. The windows are uh, very different. So you can actually sell your films everywhere. 
And I've, I've seen incredible cases where, let's say, not only they know the niche, but in a particular area, everything works very well. Let's say, again, before we talked about, I mean, the Orthodox churches, I mean, there are thousands of cases out there. If you have the right film, you can, let's say, uh, have a good strategy in one territory and be very successful there. And let's say you already sold the film to a distributor in another territory. You don't want to deal with that because somebody is doing that for you. So again, you have all the flexibility to choose your price, to choose like your strategy. And uh, um, but I think it's very important always to look, try to look the big picture. Again, these examples were very interesting even to me to understand how it was actually effective and we saw the numbers and the numbers to be honest I know the VOD numbers because uh, I've seen I mean uh, the some results in uh, several platforms but it's these these numbers were quite impressive you know in terms of the digital uh, and uh, I've seen apart from Netflix even iTunes I mean the figures you can see there you can actually achieve them with this file because I, I believe it's very important to, them, uh, to have the right expectation of things. It's not, I cannot tell you, you're going to make a million out of this three, five placing your, your title with 15 uh, publishers. That's not correct. But, I mean, if you saw the, f uh, the figures before, you could actually outperform, let's say, iTunes, if you do the right strategy. And if you think about your production costs, let's put it, I always like to, to think even in a business <laughs> um, a clear mind, you can have a really, I mean, a good return on investment, let's put it this way. And it's very effective to use it, and it's very effective to use social media in the right way. So this is, um, this is my experience on, uh, on this trip. Everybody's passionate, and you are the first uh, promoter and the most passionate uh, if you are the producer and the director so no one better than you can work online actually what's the audience like and uh, how to engage with them because they want to engage with you if they're interested in you and if they're engaged they can pay otherwise I mean it's uh, is not the, the the land of milk and honey I mean the, obviously the online world it's very different the way it works people tend to don't pay it's that's the reality of things especially if they're not engaged if they feel this is a general content video. Uh, the last thing I would like to say, if we see uh, what is very important is video in general for publishers online. I'm not saying something that uh, seems like obvious, but it's not. Um, many publishers are looking for video content because that they have a problem too with their business model too. And so video content online and uh, publishers, they really need quality uh, video content. So this is something you have to look and if you make some research on that, that's something that can, in the long term, help you to, to understand our work. So this is something that they need to, uh, because uh, obviously the revenue streams, for uh, they are going down, uh, and uh, video content is, is the only thing that potentially could almost uh, reach and replace that. So this is everything I, I need to say. Thank you very much for, uh, for your time.